hip hop became meaningful me as for me meaningful for me as part of my identity or a way to inform and shape my identity it gave me a sense of belonging mm -hmm. it gave me like uh you know a community to operate within um and it connected as well to my black heritage as well because it's a you know black music and you know the origins of it all and everything it, it something about that was meaningful for me on that level as well mm -hmm. i don't think i was uh, aware of this kind of um conscious of this at the time mm -hmm. i was just a teenager getting into mm -hmm. you know music i found fun you know but i i look back and realize that it it meant a lot to me and means a lot to me mm. in a broader way street culture tv beatbox created and we need to talk about world music and street culture killer killer podcast Send them up, Ignition. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, as central as any of you folk would either want to be, try to be, or deserve to be. How sponsors the mighty GK Nifty Heads have a massive 100,000 play to earn NFTs to give away to the streets. Just hit the link in the description or go to gkniftyheads.com and get ready for Hoddle Wars Summer 2024. It's a beautiful, beautiful day in the world of street culture. We hot step and move about, uh, trying our best to mind our own business and we've got ourselves into trouble. Um, but uh, trouble has seemed to have found me in the form of a gentleman that takes me right back to my early days and a lot of your early days too. So you've got no excuses but to tune in and check out. This bloke has been a, a confidant, uh, somebody that has been associated with all of my adventures around uh, the globe. He's a UK hip hop pioneer, uh, collaborating with likes of Lewis Parker, the uh, ever faithful DJ Mr. Thing, um, Doc Brown, Verb T. I mean, the list will go on. If you're into UK hip hop, then you'll be a fool not to know this gentleman with a new release. He goes by the name of Essa. What yes, we say? Bro. Yes, bro. Thank you, man. Love the intro. Woo. Love it. <laughs> no, I mean, it's hard to kind of put it all into one bottle. Like, this has been a, a, a very a long a long time coming this podcast right? it has man i'm glad to connect on this and it's good to get an opportunity to kind of tell my story a bit you know? mm. yeah. yeah a bit of a deep dive so to speak um how deep we go is, is another story i mean so you, you you're a family man mm -hmm. you, you you're you're a, you're a lawyer as well lawyer yeah solicitor yeah so yeah, don't yeah. fuck with us. All of this, it's all tools and skills. And we were kind of just suggesting this at the start of the, before we started recording, wasn't it? The, the kind of mind juggle of that. Yeah, it's difficult. So um, we're all busy people, you know, yeah. and we're all grown ups. And but I've got myself into a situation where I have lots of uh, things that really matter to me a, a lot that mm -hmm. I'm pursuing at the same time. My career as a lawyer. My career as an artist and my life as a father, husband, friend, you know, so mm. there is a, there's a lot in my life, mm. um, but it's, it's a real blessing, you mm. know, it's a, it's a constant juggle. I'm having I mean, to figure out how to, you know, balance things all the time. Mm. And each time you um, water one plant, another one is a bit thirsty mm. and then you've got to turn, you know, your focus to elsewhere. But I'm getting a little bit better at it as I as I get you know more sophisticated. Do you think people are accommodating to that uh, uh, that weather that you have to kind of face? I mean, family, close family is one thing, but you know, then those moments where you're just hold on, I just got to get this phone call, and you're not you're you're kind of you're you're losing your own perspective, your personality. Things are ha things are hanging on the singular mm. words you say. That that must be quite well. Some challenging. people, some people get it and some people less so. Um, what has been working for me mm. is that um, my, let's just say my two careers in particular, mm -hmm. um, they overlap. So I'm a lawyer, but I'm a lawyer in the entertainment and media industry. Mm. So a lot of the people I know through music and the things that we talk about and the world I'm connected with through being an artist overlaps with what I do as a lawyer. And therefore it's not quite as much of a jarring kind of wrench when I jump from one world to the next because mm. actually they they connect. And even more so, people that I've got relationships with as a creative become business relationships as a lawyer as well. So perfect example, the person that used to manage me is still a manager for lots of other artists and he now brings a lot of his talent to me and I can be their lawyer and I represent them and we do business and we do deals together all the time. 20 Yo. years or whatever 
you know, going strong, but just in different capacities, different roles, you know? Wow. And there's no conflict of kind of interest there? No, because he doesn't manage me now. And okay. we, it's like a separate... Separate role, separate oh, wow. separate stage, I guess, of, of our evolving relationship together. Shout out to Mark. Yeah, I'll, tie it, I'll tie it, Mark. Yeah. You know what time it is. That's, that's incredible. Um, did you ever, I mean, you know, we'll go back as far as we need to go back, mm -hmm. but did you ever think that y your your timeline of career careers would, would kind of cross streams like that? Um, I, I always first saw it coming into conflict and people were like when are you going to quit one or the other and which is it going to be mm, yeah. and I and I I kind of couldn't get my head around the question in some ways mm. because I'd always wanted to be creative I used to love theatre and dramatic arts mm. and then got heavily into music rap and it's just always has been and will be a part of mm. me but was always also ambitious on the kind of career level with becoming a lawyer. In fact, when people used to ask me as a kid, what job are you going to have when you grow up? I, I would have said lawyer. Mm. Not, I would have been like, I'm going to be a rapper. Like, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. A, a lawyer because, well, African dad, like rapper is doesn't count as a job. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> it yeah. doesn't count. Uh, yeah. like, so, so, you know, it was always the expectation that I'd be doing something else. Mm. Um, and so I guess I was always pursuing the two and never really thinking, well, when, how will I... Like I just just carried on that way, mm -hmm. and and it's carried on through to today, where I'm releasing music, I'm you know, creating all the time. You're so consistent, bro. You are so consistent. Like I, I I forget how many playlists I've got with your tune, one two tunes on. Do you know what I mean on the real? Like I, I sometimes you just because someone's a constant, mm. it's, it's not taken for granted. But I, like, I appreciate that. I mean, it's it's funny you say that because for me, I feel like there have been big gaps in my output. But what people may or may not realize is that there's never been gaps in the creative act. Mm. Like I write every day mm. pretty much. And I don't do that as like a sort of a discipline. It just happens mm. every day. Like I get ideas, whether it's one line that I just quickly jot down and keep in my stash mm. or whether it's a whole song that I end up recording, but like it's pretty much every day and it has been for a couple of decades. Mm. So I've got a lot of material. Doc Brown always like, cusses me for this he's like so what like you don't put any of this shit out like <laughs> no one even knows bro Can imagine a you conversation between the he, you two yeah. he just gives me like a real <laughs> he tells it. me off about it really with good reason yeah, yeah. but the the creativity's there but there's been gaps in the in the output mm. and because i haven't been able to join all the dots of okay i've made this stuff how do i like finish it get it mixed get it you mm. know like completed to the standard in the way that i want i'm quite ambitious with that and then also do a proper rollout and release it. And mm. do, there's a lot of logistics involved um, and that's got in the way when there's been so much other stuff in life for me. But I've kind of found a way through that now with the help of many, many great people. Mm. Um, so I've got a whole team around me now of of really loyal and like, you know, um, talented people who are just contributing in lots of different ways to me being able to actually realise some of these ideas. Mm. And so I'm looking to now have a whole period of quite consistent output. You know, oh, yeah. delegation isn't it that's what that is it is yeah and it's learning like hold on if i sort of sit on this job and try and do this myself when i get the time or make the space for mm. it then at best i might do an okay late job mm. of that mm. whereas if i know someone else who's actually really good at that and cares and wants to do it then and i ask them and and we share then it's going to happen more effectively. Mm. And, and part of the stumbling block for, for that, for me, was always a sort of, will anyone want to get involved speculatively in this thing, this this grand dream I've got? Mm. You know what I mean? And I don't like to come to people with like, can you do this for me? How do you nurture that, though? Because you find somebody, this is, you know, it's almost like a kind of mirror of... The, I think we all get to that point where mm. it, it has to be delegated. Mm. How, where do you find that sweet spot where there's a person who wants to get involved but they can't get involved too much because they need to get paid by xyz or they they want to be lawyers themselves or something like that right. but the music is something they want to follow as a passion mm. like you're there in front of them face to face and you know they've got that talent mm. but how far down the line do you want to take that it's 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 kind of listening really what what i've experienced in the last year or two is realizing there's people around me that want to get involved and people ask me, hey, what's going on with your stuff, bro? How's this, you know? Mm. And I'm like, oh, yeah, cool. And then some of them have been like, let me know if you ever need any help with this, that, the other. And now I'm like, yes, please. 
I would mm. love that help, mm. and let's talk, and let's go straight. Whereas before, I'd be like, oh, yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. And Call you next just, week. Uh, kind of thing. And just don't really actually crystallise it. Whereas there's people who, mm. you know, literally have, like, volunteered to to get involved in various ways, and now we're, like, doing proper work together. What's, the thing, what's the thing that you wish someone would be delegative of a job for to take wow. off of your hands? Oh, my God, I've got so many of them. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I, I hate time management, oh, and, and I would love, I mean, I already have a superb secretary at my office yeah. as a lawyer who I literally cannot function without, you know. So she, uh, Can she's we have so, a name, please? We've got to big her up. Shout out to Elaine. Come Elaine, on, Elaine. Hold you. tight, Elaine. <laughs> the, uh, big shout out to Ashley. That's mine. That's, the, the, my, there's our go-to girls right there. Amazing. Right? Yeah. You know, so that's a huge, a huge part of um, being able to function. But I think the main one for me is kind of creating visuals to go with stuff. And I've got some Ooh. amazing people around me who have been helping me just put out a documentary, actually, about my first album. Wow. Half-hour documentary, and it's, like, it's amazingly well put together. That's and incredible. Yeah, shout-out to Ricky and Louis and Ben oh, Coons and everyone that helped me with that. Yeah, yeah. But um, I'm, I'm looking to get into a rhythm of regularly creating visual material because I've, I've now got the kind of machine in place to create the music to the standard that I, you know, that I mm. want with enough people around me and a way to get it to final product, mm. you know, and like top quality. Mm. But on the visuals, I'm still working at how to get that as an efficient process. I can get there sometimes, but I always mm. find it a challenge. And it's not, I don't think I grew up in that world, you know, like it's different. I think there's... Hey, you just came to rap, man. Yeah. That's really what it is. <laughs> it's about the bars. Yeah. <laughs> Dude, I'm there as well. Just, you know, you know give me a mic. Right. I, you know, what's funny is that I think all of a sudden, um, maybe this is age. Maybe it's wisdom. Maybe it's knowing full maturity. well. Maturity. We maturity, yes. not age. <laughs> see, things like that, see. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's just the idea of going beyond what our original plan was. And at this point in our careers, understanding that, okay, that's how the machine worked. This is how it works now. This is why I don't want to be part of that machine. But I can create this machine. Mm. I can do that myself. And I think everyone that, that at least has a some sort of finger on the pulse within the scene that they're in, they can do it, can't they? Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of knowing what your where you fit in and what you what you can offer mm. and, and and you know what others can offer and how to how to match that together, mm. you know? Um, I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm less good at mm. and I know what I enjoy doing and don't enjoy as much. And I'm just trying to find the right ways to fill out the whole team where there's somebody out there that loves to do the bit that mm. I'm not so keen on, mm. you know, and just that's mm. the way to win. I always, I always wonder why, why do you love that role so much? Like <laughs> just trying to get some hands for years. Bro, I'm a lawyer. Like yeah. people are literally, the bit that I do as a lawyer, people are like, that is the bit that I cannot touch, cannot stand. Yeah. And there's me like going through the contracts and thinking about, all sorts of technical issues, and I get an intellectual stimulation from that. I find that rewarding on some level, you know. Wow! Well, like in the same way, people I guess, hate it, you know. But that must be the same same case with writing. That's why yeah, you do it every day. It's very connected because to me, um, it's all to do with language and ex mm. and communication. You know, expressing things through words, understanding things through words. You know, but then with the legal stuff, there's this extra element where. The, the communication is between two or more parties. And you've got to think not just about your perspective and what you're trying to achieve. You've got to think about their perspective, what they want to achieve. Maybe there's two, three, four different parties and you've got to find the balance. I, I do deals. I don't mm. do cases. I, I'm a deal maker, you know. Um, and so you've got to think about how things come together. And I find that interesting. The creative act is in some ways more simple. Like it's just, it's me creating and then there's whoever may hear it and respond to it. And actually... I think on a on a good creativity, you try and think less about the world out there responding to what you're mm. creating. You try and just focus on creating and expressing, yeah. and leave the response to the world. It's, you just give it up and it's up to people to yeah. just you know make up what they will. Man, you just sent my mind into a theory. Like for a long time now, I've been, you know just the the whole idea of a a, a kind of invisible game of chess that you have to play just in life in general really <laughs> i mean you're you're playing in real time all the time with really big money involved and big cases and mm. not cases but you know deals, deals. yeah you know that's yeah th that's that's some mad discipline yeah discipline is like um a big part of it and uh it's how i grew up you know like you know 
I'm uh, of mixed heritage, English and Nigerian. Mm -hmm. And from the Nigerian Igbo part of my culture, and some of this is specific to my own particular family, mm -hmm. but my, my father's side of the family this is, and my father was disciplinarian. Mm -hmm, <laughs> like, mm -hmm. And there's, a, there's quite a big culture of that, many different cultures, but certainly um, Nigerian, other African families as well. Mm -hmm. Like I hear a lot of people say, yeah, of course, like, you know, African parents, they have certain expectations. Mm -hmm. And discipline was a key part of it. And a lot of the drive and ambition and the kind of professionalism I have, um, parts of that I attribute to that aspect of my upbringing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's this whole other side of it that I got through my mother and through just growing up in the way that I did, where there's kind of a balance to me and other other sides to me as well. Um, North London. Yeah, North London. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, mm. nice. Not too far from these neck of the woods, to yeah. say the least. <laughs> um, what was it like? Uh, I mean, let's, let's go for the jugular. What was the grab of hip hop at its time for you and music as a whole? So I think um, I've come to understand this better with hindsight and with maturity. <laughs> <laughs> maturity. Uh, not age, because I'm actually no. pretty young. Yeah, I know. It's me too. Um, but, yeah. but, um, at the time, I was just like, this is the coolest thing I've ever seen. This is exciting. Mm -hmm. It was rebellious. It was all these other things. And um, that excited me and grabbed me. And uh, w the era we're talking about is early 90s. And it's things like mm. records that got me into it. Actually, before even realizing, I was already into like De La Soul because um, my older sisters would, would play Three Feet High and Rising. And I remember getting a Frosties packet with a flexi disc of I Know, I think, inside it. Wow, that's which, crazy. Which I was like, oh, wow, and I played that with my serial kind of thing. But then um, that was before I even really knew what rap was or mm. hip hop. I didn't really understand as a whole culture. I just was yeah. like, I like this thing, you know? Yeah. And then um, it was probably Snoop's first album, 93, wow. when I was really was like, okay, now I'm aware of hip hop mm. and this being a thing. and this is now a thing that I'm really mm -hmm. into. And it became quite defining for me. Wow. And it went from there and I listened to previous stuff and just stayed in tune with everything since. But I guess the thing that came with hindsight, I was just alluding to a moment ago, is there was a sort of community to belong to. Mm. And, an, and, a, and it meant something for me on an identity level. So mm. growing up, mixed heritage, being raised in a very middle-class white environment, but having my black identity as like a core part of who I am as well, and going between lots of different worlds, mm -hmm. as I still do. Mm -hmm. We talked about it earlier on in different contexts, but mm -hmm. like, I go between lots of different worlds. This is a very common trait for a lot of mixed heritage people. Identity is always a question to which there's a complex answer mm -hmm. for me. Um, and hip hop became meaningful me as for me meaningful for me as part of my identity or a way to inform and shape my identity it gave me a sense of belonging mm -hmm. it gave me like uh you know a community to operate within um and it connected as well to my black heritage as well because it's a you know black music and you know the origins of it all and everything it, it something about that was meaningful for me on that level as well mm -hmm. i don't think i was uh, aware of this kind of um Conscious of this at the time, mm -hmm. I was just a teenager getting into, mm -hmm. you know, music I found fun, you know. But I, I look back and realise that it, it meant a lot to me and means a lot to me mm. in a broader way, you know. Yeah, I do know what you mean. I think this is the curious thing about hip hop and it, it, it really... It really hones in on your circumstance. My, my state, and I say that because for a lot of people, entry holes like Snoop Dogg, it's reasonably unrelatable mm. from a UK standpoint. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah the, the stuff he was singing about was nothing to no, do with my life. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, we do get the odd low rider going through <laughs> fucking, you know, Harrow Road. But no, but the truth is, is that you were you enter in a portal to that, mm. and you find the thing that is almost it's just so much hip hop in there there's mm. decades and decades and decades and you find I was never like dare I say I wasn't the biggest De La Soul fan fan right. the Native Tongues thing up against NWA forget it like right. I'm NWA <laughs> but you know this is the point isn't it it's mm. that you find something and then but there's everyone loves it all that's the other mm. thing as well because there's this there's this art multiple art forms that are happening aren't there well the, the thing is, as well with hip hop is um, to be an appreciator of hip hop culture is to appreciate many other 
mm. genres and cultures as well. Yeah. So I love jazz, mm. I love soul, you know, and many other forms of music and, you know, that that you that people use as the building blocks to create hip hop, mm. you know? Um, and I started to, again, learn that retrospectively. So formed a lifelong uh, connection and partnership with Mr. Thing. And he, he educated me on music. I had this the deep privilege of touring around with Thing um, and we would drive in from, you know, to different shows and stuff and we'd hop in his car and he would like play me a bunch of beats he's just made and then we would turn those into records. But then he'd also be like, you ever heard what, what was used to make this record and that? And he would play me these like classic soul records. Crazy. And that made me a, a huge fan of soul music, you know, ever since. But then there's all sorts of other, you know, lanes and genres. And to me that... That's hip hop to understand mm. that stuff and to be into it. So it kind of became my education about music in general yeah. was to, to to get into hip hop. Mm. Yeah, uh, Mr. Thing is an absolute beast when it comes to <laughs> Mr. Thing, man. Shout out. <laughs> when I was younger, we was touring a lot, and uh, yeah, it, the amount of records that I walked away with, thinking to myself, "Did I need them?" Yeah, no, Mr. Thing said I needed them. <laughs> Literally says <laughs> you need that. Yeah. He, he's just handed them to me, like, <laughs> yeah. you need that. Yeah. So it's only, I'll buy it's them. 30p, get it? You know, it's literally the weight alone in the flight is just like <laughs> extra 57 quid, didn't you? It's like, it's what's, you know, they talk about collateral damage. This is like <laughs> collateral benefit. Just yeah, be around yeah. him and like extra good stuff happens to you. you it's know? so true. It's so, it's enriching, particularly from a music point of view. And you're right, because I think, uh, and I'm not saying this isn't uh, applicable in most genres nowadays. I think, I think that, it can be quite overwhelming for people to want to get into a scene that has so much depth. Mm, you know, like mm. the idea of me being like wholeheartedly super all involved in reggae right now. Right. All I think to myself is, oh my God, that's just, a, a, it's just a winding road of stuff I don't know. Well, you yeah, know? there's definitely, um, there's a sort of exclusiveness of some sort where mm. it's like, to be part of something, you need to be initiated. You need to know, you need to pay your dues, all these things. And like, there's a strange thing, and I think this also appealed to me on some level, where like, I've always felt like an outsider. But when it comes to hip hop, I feel like I understand and I know. Mm. And I've, I've paid my dues and I've done my research mm. and I feel like I have earned to, my right to have a seat at the table of mm, some sort. Mm, mm, mm. And, and therefore, I have to resist the temptation to then get a bit, uh, I, I'm going to call it snobbish, like about like those that maybe haven't quite gone that mm -hmm. journey or mm -hmm. like don't understand the culture mm -hmm. and they're just sort of throwing themselves into stuff. I think I have to, you know, not be too snobbish about that because you don't want to like um, be snooty, no, you know? Okay, but, yeah. but there's, but I'm being very real about the fact that something about that also appealed to me. This, mm. I talked about a sense of belonging and a sense of identity. Well, with that, you know, part of that was a sense of like, being included in something that not everybody knew about or understood, Ooh, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah, community. and Community. It, it all kind of stemmed, just segues nicely into the Deal Real era, the mm -hmm. old and new Deal Real, the record store culture and how important that was, particularly for the age that, you know, we, we enter into these scenes. You know, you can't just readily jump into a club scenario, you know, and meet these heroes on stage or behind the decks, you know. You, mm. These were like, these were like, opportunist moments weren't they yeah so i mean a lot of um the path that i went on and where opportunities really opened up it all came gradually and organically and there were certain key people and key uh uh sort of connection points so mm. best example and the you know obvious first one for me is meeting harry love mm -hmm. who still to this day one of the most talented you know Hands producers down. i've ever ever known Hands down. and he was the first producer I ever met. And so the first time I actually made proper tunes, you know, till then it was like freestyling over people's beats and maybe even writing a whole song, but over someone's beat or whatever. Not not like, as in over an instrumental on the B mm -hmm. side of a 12 inch. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I mean? like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I finally met him, suddenly we were able to actually make records yeah. and make songs. And I, 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 I love to just spit on a beat, but I really love songs and writing yeah. a song and, and he, has the craft, you know, and so we put stuff together. And then he just introduced me to all sorts of people because he was um, he was young at that time. We both were young, but he was he's a few years younger than me, but he was already um, part of Scratch Perverts and he mm. was like doing shows and Elevating routines. Fast, yeah. And like 
that was at a time in particular when the turntablism was really like taking off as a mm. thing that everyone was like in awe of. Plus and, he had the you know, SPs, he was an enabler. He really was. He 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 contributed a lot to that yeah. whole thing, you know. Um so it was yeah, he he made a huge difference, introduced me to lots of people mm. and you know, that whole world of record shops, you know, mm. I would just go from one to the other mm. like for whole <laughs> yeah. chunks of the day and then you <laughs> People like Harry would be like, oh, have you met this person? You need to know them. And I'd meet them. And it's just kind of gradually building my familiarity and connection with yeah. that community and that scene. And yeah. I learned as, as I went along, you know? It's a golden, gorgeous time of it, wasn't it? It was wonderful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it's, you know, I, I have to resist the temptation to sound like a kind of moaning old man now. <laughs> but what I will say is I worry that some of that may, either it's, it just doesn't happen in that same way because so much of that connection happens online now. Mm. And that's got good things about it or bad things about it. Like the, one of the good things is that can happen internationally. Mm -hmm. I had to connect in London with people within like arm's reach sort yeah. of thing. And broaden out. Yeah, and broaden okay, out yeah. from there. But like, you know, there are people who could be in LA or, you know, Thailand right mm. now, like checking out the stuff that we're doing. Mm. And that is a, another, you know, way of connecting. But there's something nice about that in-person... 100%. ...sort of um, just natural, organic, social way of stuff growing. Yeah. Maybe it still just happens, but I'm an old guy. I don't really go... I, no, I'm not old. I'm mature. I'm mature guy. <laughs> but I'm not really hanging out like that as much like I used to. I'm too busy working or parenting or creating. Yeah, and I think the parenting, you know, and also the... You know what I was coming to is the quicker people get to know that the handshake is far more important than the profile mm. or the business card. Like, I think that's what it is at the end of the day because that's what creates that community, mm. these, these community moments, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think it's... There's genuine connection, you know? Yeah. I, I do, like, um, a lot of networking as part of my job as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. And um, I've even been to classes and training sessions about... How do you work a room? How mm. do you network in an effective way? How do you build all these different things? There's loads of thinking on it. Um, but what I would say kind of really rings true from all of that is some level of genuine human connection is important because without that, it's all just surface level. Yeah. If it's like, hey, I'm Nick, I'm a lawyer. Here's my business card. You need a lawyer? Call me. Yeah. Like that just washes over people. They yeah. don't really, you know. But if you actually have a decent conversation or you find the common ground, find a way that you actually connect, mm then it's like there's much more likelihood that that could lead to something mutually beneficial. But performing live and being, you know, in amongst people, strangers sometimes, <laughs> but especially at a young age, I mean, that that's enough to give you like, I can work any room because I know exactly the coordinates. You know what I mean? It's interesting that. I mean, it, it, it took a lot for me because I'm not an outgoing personality. You know, I'm kind of more the shy observer type mm. like thinks and watches what's going on i'm not the first one to speak up about stuff typically that's changed over time and you know pe some people that know me now would be surprised to hear me describe myself that way yeah yeah yeah. you know um but it took me a while and also to perform and to get up in, in, on stage in front of my peers or the mm. people i wanted to be my mm, peers mm. there was pressure yeah, and, yeah. I, and i found that and it was daunting especially also goofy middle class kid from like a leafy sort of suburban area mm. going to like these quite edgy hip hop shows mm. like you know and I was young as well mm. and like just you know it was difficult for me to mm. navigate and also to be well what what became important to me was to be authentic mm. to be myself I didn't want to be like this guy's trying pretending to be see any way you survive in those environments you've got to be authentic and be real and so I, I just kind of stuck to that that's, yeah. I, I can relate with that being from outside of London, man. Mm. Something, something, it's like I'm off to flame. Something drives you into that space. Mm. What is that thing? Well, I mean, I think it's partly that acceptance thing that I talked about before, like wanting to be part of something, mm. you know. Um, I also just, I, I just love the craft. I mm. love the art form. Like, mm. I love putting words together. I love seeing like masterful craft, you know, on a musical level, Ooh. lyrical level. Let's stick and that with the just craft. drives me to it. Yeah, you know? Let's stick with the craft for a second because, yeah, your, the, the, the timbre, the sound, the vocal that you have, and I'm saying this hands, hands down, 
I'm like, that's something special. Like, I love the tone of your voice on record. Mm. Couple that with, you mentioned, you know, all forms of music and, you know, crediting Harry Love for his production value, which makes it more than just an average beat. Mm. But you also have a way of structuring your songs. Yeah. Yeah. songs do you know what i mean then there's the lyrics themselves i mean there's a lot there's a there's a this thes- thes- thesaurus is that, it's a thesaurus, thesaurus. <laughs> there's a language here we can talk but yeah for real like um talk to me about the craft talk to me about the yeah. th- the disciplines talk to me about how you process and who more importantly uh, are your influences so i mean the craft is a is um multifaceted you know because there are people who i think have got a witty turn of phrase mm. and um, they can entertain, <clears throat> but they might not stimulate a lot of thought or they might not be able to craft like a, a, a sort of a song mm. really has like strength as a song, mm. you know, there's people the other way around, like they can craft great songs, you know, and whatever else, but mm. they, but could they you just put on a beat and ask them to spit and they're not going to impress uh. the room. They're just, people be like, mm. yeah. Um, so, the goal has been, and that's just two metrics. That's just two different. <laughs> th- the goal for me is always to try and do as well as I can on all those aspects of the craft, you know. Mm. And you talked a moment ago about um, vocal tone mm. and you know cadence and like this. Mm. this stuff. Part of that is natural in the sense of my voice is my voice, mm. but also I project my voice and I and I kind of do things with it as I record mm. and, and when I'm performing live, and mm. that's another parameter to play mm. with, you know. And so there's all these different things at once. And I'm 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 just trying to be the top trump card, yeah, you know, with yeah. like 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what yeah. I'm going for. But not a lot of people um, can, uh, and you know, there's there's so many reasons why one of the 10 is just the downfall. Yeah. Like, yeah, the, and yeah, it's, yeah. you know, it's the, those degrees of, of, you know, great or greatest, isn't that's it? That's it. And, and you asked me about the influences again, there's just so many, like mm. some have influenced me in respect of that one particular aspect of the craft that mm. they shine in, you know, but there's a handful of people that have got that top Trump card, like 10 in every category. Mm. There's very few, but a good example for me is Black Thought, who can do everything. Mm. Yeah. Can do it, he can do it all yeah. um, to a very high standard. Another one is Getz. Getz can do all the different aspects <sighs> of the craft to a yeah. very high level. Yeah. Um, and there's many, many more, you yeah. know, but like that, that whole like complete approach mm. where, you know, I've heard both of those people write very thought provoking songs. I've, I've seen them just jump up and body a verse as well yeah. to the point yeah. of like fear in the, amongst the other MCs around <laughs> fear, like fear. You know, what, you know, that, that another guy that, that I, I've seen kind of that fear is and I won't say where or when. Um, Dugs. Dugs. He evokes guy. fear. Fear. <laughs> because like you can't do that, can you? He he can do that, yeah. but you can't do that. No. As no. In, he's, <laughs> You know what he just did there? You can't do that. <laughs> he just gone and done it. He just does it like it's natural. Like just the way he skips. Just the the uh, change of pace. Yeah. The the cadence. The like he and again like multifaceted. You know, like because yeah. he's not just like blah 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 blah. Like yeah. he's saying some thought provoking stuff as well. Like yeah. He, yeah. And also for, for for someone like me as well, like you play my music next to his. I'm, actually, he's got like a broad range of different styles and sounds, but like Genres, yeah. they're they're not this like you know put it this way. He's more from a grime world. I'm more from a hip hop world. Mm-hmm. Within the hip hop, it's more the kind of soulful jazz influence side of mm-hmm. it. There is actually overlap because I've heard him on tracks like that as well. Yeah, I did that Sun and Noise remix as well. That was sick. Right. I'm trying yeah. To go and look that up. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. But but like you know, I I get inspired by people who you people wouldn't expect. Mm. Where like. They listen to my style and my sound and they yeah. wouldn't realise I might appreciate someone like a Dugs because yeah. but I, I appreciate him for what he does within the craft. And craft is craft. Mm. Like I admire it, you know, as a thing in itself. Mm. When you can see someone really good at what they do, that's inspiring, even if what they do is quite different to what I do. Yeah. I think with a lot of these conversations, when we're talking about influences and you know, how we get by in creating, being inspired. Um these are these are early um incremental stages of development where 
by the time you get to, I'm putting out my records, mm. I'm putting out my releases, I know what I am, I know my thing, and then, and then the industry kind of, the, 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 the business kicks in. Mm. And obviously being a lawyer has a huge home field advantage. Mm. But you, you, again, it just goes back to those double head things where it's like, okay, so was, I'm coming to this because, uh, you know, off the bat, there was, there was a level of conversation on recall. Um, you were out doing lawyer thing, mm. come inside here. It was almost like reset. Mm-hmm. Um, it's that kind of discipline that you have to install in, in once you get into that music industry aspect, isn't it? Yeah, you have to be able to switch between different scenarios. Yeah. In fact, as a, as a lawyer, um, a key th- especially a kind of deal-making mm. lawyer of the kind that I am, you need to look at things from different perspectives. Mm. You, you can't just look at it from your own perspective and what you want to achieve. Some people do, and that can be quite a, in my opinion, unsophisticated approach. Because mm. if I want to achieve what I want to achieve, I need to know what the other people are trying to achieve as well. Because mm. somewhere there's probably that zone where it works for everybody, yeah. you know? Um, so we uh, also, whenever you're receiving pushback, you know, there's a negotiation scenario. You're trying to put yourself into the shoes of the other party mm. and think, well, why, why are they approaching it this way? What, what matters to them? Mm. And something about that, that shift, that, that skill of mm. shifting perspectives, mm. um, I think is useful as well in, in the kind of lifestyle I have where mm. I have to shift from one thing to the next all the time. You know, mm. think about um, different worlds and different stuff that's going on. I think it's a skill that I've been trained in. Yeah, and it's not a skill that you can readily have as a, as an artist. I don't think so, but but one thing I would say is there's a level of that that is also something that comes from the nature of my upbringing and my heritage, mm, okay, my, God, my yeah. mixed heritage, Yeah, where I never felt I particularly fit within one category or place in the world, mm. one group, whatever, you know, so... I'd always think about that perspective and then also that one because mm. both were part of my experience mm. so that that became an early um trait of mm. mine with, again this is something i've learned with maturity yeah yeah, yeah but it's 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 been a trait of mine throughout my life and i've been fortunate to cultivate it yeah and to uh find a way for that to be part of what i do mm. with my career it's, does that does that cultivation extend into the releases of the record like the influence of the songs yeah, I think, I mean, I'm trying to get better at the full process. And the creative act is like my, my favourite bit of it. Mm-hmm. But what it's like a tree falling in the woods if you create a great record and no one ever hears it. Yeah. What's the point? Yeah, no one yeah. even knows it happened. Yeah. So you have to do the whole process. And I'm trying to think about, inherent in that is thinking about how it's received on some mm. level. And I'd struggle with that because I think that is counter to creativity, to think a lot about how it's received. Yeah. If that influences the way you create, that can lead to mm. to substandard creation, you know. And I'm, I've been as guilty of this as 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 others would be. So where you kind of, I want to make a tune like this. I mm. want to be where that person mm. is. So if maybe I can make a you know club mm. banger, or mm. I can make a this that. And when they made that club banger, that person you've been inspired by. They were just doing their thing. No, yeah, they weren't. It wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, right. Today we're going to put A and B in together. We get. They just create, and that's what they're like, and that's mm. what they do, and they make that sick thing. And I'm jealous of them. <laughs> <laughs> but like, equally, when it comes to stuff that I do, that some people don't do so well, or they mm. would, they get inspired by because they're like, "How does he do that?" That's me being me in and in my own mm. lane and doing what I do. So some of the deep lyricism stuff or the kind of vulnerable, like the poetic type stuff or that insightful stuff, that's me. Like, that's what I do. Mm. So, And not everyone will be able to f- f- hit that no. shelf of the record of people's collections. And and not everyone appreciates it. Like Some people are like, I don't really care about that. I, I was speaking to someone recently, an artist who I really like, who um, was also, they said, inspired by me. But they're like, I hate bars and spitting and that kind of, and I don't like any, I just like songs, you know, when mm. people rap. Yeah. And it was a really interesting thought because I was like, wow, I love bars. I love lyricism, yeah. but I also love songs. But they were like, no, oh, leave, leave me with all that rap, 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 rap. Stuff. Like, and I get it. Mm. I get it because they're like, you know, you don't need to, you know, force that upon me. Like, yeah, you can rap well. Like, great. But show me a song and make it catch. Make it feel good. Yeah. Give it a vibe. Yeah, I you get know? you. I get you. It's cool in a skit and everything. But when you're actually making songs that are relentlessly drive, 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 bars, bars, bars. bars yeah. You need that, balance. Yeah. You need yeah. balance, you know. And like, and I've reached a point, I feel, where 
I'm getting better and better at that balance. So the new album I've been working on, just finished an album. Uh, title, uh, what's it called? Tell us. It's called Resonance. Resonance. Resonance by Ooh. me and Pitch 92. Pitch it's a 92. collab album, me and Pitch 92 Sick. together. And this is like, from my perspective, it's probably my most complete and balanced body of work so far. How and, exciting. You know, yeah, I'm 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 very, very proud of it. Like, you know, I enjoy listening to it. <laughs> you know you what? Know. Yeah, I bet it, I bet it also helps the perspective, you know, you step away a little bit more when you know it's in collaboration with someone, a trusted producer that you know he's yeah. got ears on it as well. You kinda you do get this opportunity to remove yourself a bit more, don't you? You do, and like, you know, we make creative decisions jointly, mm. you know, and that kind of it brings the best out, I think, you know. Um, he's very, he's been very easy to work with. The, the, the kind of interesting thing that I, we didn't know each other from way back, but I uh, knew of his work mm. and other people had told me, I remember Verb T saying to me one day, you need to connect with Pitch one day. You two would make a, a great thing together. And I was like, oh, okay. I checked him out. And, but then it was years later that we actually connected. But as soon as we did connect, he was like, I've got some beats that I thought you might like to hear. And let me check these out. And the hit rate in terms of like, when I'm played beats by people, it's often quite low, as in like, it's not that I'm like super, okay, I am picky. <laughs> but like, as in I'm trying to find the one that really suits me. Yeah. And there's some beats that are sick that I wish it suited yeah. me, but actually it doesn't. So, so I it's like to, a three and 10 or something, something bangs, but they... This is nine out of 10. And he's like, do you, do you like this? Yeah. Do you wow. like this? Yeah. Do you like this? Yeah. And I was like, Phew. came away with like a whole stash of beats and I made a record out of, I made a track out of, every single one wow like we just and bam there it is an album how long did it and, take how long did it take to do well the early stage of it was fast in terms of like quick ideas getting together but then i have this like grand ambition with stuff where i'm like that beat and, and a rhyme is great but we need to have someone singing there mm. i'd love to have more instrumentation on that this is the technical <laughs> bit this is when it becomes long it's long <laughs> and i'm i'm guilty of this i need to do one where it's literally a beat tape and I just rap on the beats yeah, yeah. and like, don't do let it, it go. But I cannot help myself <laughs> yeah, because yeah. I'm like, oh, if this could be like that. Yeah. And, and actually what's amazing on this pro project is we've done all of that. We've got, we like, as in mm -hmm. many projects in the past, it's been like, oh, if only we could yeah. maybe, but like there's him and there's a, uh, an engineer producer that we've been working with called Viva C, mm -hmm. who I've been working with in a different capacity nice. before. Incredible producer and multi-instrumentalist really? and mixing engineer, mastering engineer. His sonics are off the, cha off the chart. And he came on board as, like, I, I call him the finisher. <laughs> you bring something to him that's like 75, 80% there, and it's just, psh, <laughs> hands it back to you and you're like, oh my God. That's, like, and he, I love people he just like that. adds bits. He, he can sort Good. of help realize your vision, yeah. you know, in a way that's faithful to what you've done, yeah. you know? Need them um, in life in general, man. For everything, everything in life, the extra twenty percent is everything. Isn't it's everything, it? you know. And his own stuff is incredible as well. Really, you know? so, yeah, yeah. seriously, yeah. Uh, getting a record to the point that you're exceptionally proud of it. You can listen to it over and over again. You've not burnt your ears out with it. Mm. I mean, that's that's a celebration itself. But it is. And it's funny. Like I, I'm trying to learn to be more um smell the roses in my approach to life mm. where i'm always part of this thing we talked about earlier with the drive the discipline the ambition all of that is i'm relentlessly following the next goal the next goal all yeah. the time um which can actually be a slightly um it's a hard path because yeah. you don't really enjoy the fruits of your labor oh my just, god you're so right. labor yeah so i've been trying to appreciate when i have a moments win. that are a win to celebrate and what you just said of like completing a record and loving it um is a win and like literally that is the that's the grammy there yeah, like yeah. it's done and i've made it yeah. and i'm like happy and it's coming out you know it's on its way it's in the pressing plant right now Come on. so it's like that is that is a win to celebrate and yeah. i did celebrate that you know what i mean like what did you do i think i opened a bottle of champagne that's right, <laughs> that's right. and drank it so yeah drank it <laughs> Drunk at all. Yeah, fucking right. Not on my own. I was no. probably with my wife. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can't be selfish with things like this. No, it's a celebration for everyone. Uh, and time <laughs> actually helps progress that. Yeah. When you've got time to make the best decisions of a song, the best, you know, similar like, like you say, guests coming in, get the BVs right. How much time have we got? We've got, we got 30 minutes to do these BVs. It doesn't do work it. like that. Right. It's interesting that though. Like I, I once interviewed Farrah Munch and um, oh, nice. he told me about when he made... Um, 
Simon Says. And he said he'd been in a studio recently with like all the creature comforts. And it was like Erica Badu would be in one room and such mm. and such be in the next room. And they'd be all making these great songs. It was like a lovely studio. But when he made that record, he was in like a very uncomfortable studio in, I think he was saying it was summertime. It was super hot. Mm. The aircon machine was rattling and noisy. So they had to turn it off when he did a take. And it was like sweltering. And he's like, get the fuck up. And it like all came into the record wow. and made the record the amazing thing that it is because he didn't want to spend ages in that booth. He wanted mm. to go in, nail it and and get some fresh air sort of thing. Wow. So fuck. I actually think that the constraints encourage creativity. Mm. I think too much freedom, it, it, it works against the creative process. Fucking like you need right. a certain level of freedom. You don't want to be like restricted. You must make this song, this type of song right mm. now. That sucks. But like you need some level of boundary, some level of um, restriction discomfort yeah um to to really to really do it right and for me on this part of what drove me with this album was like if i don't do this now will i do another record discomfort because i'm so yeah i'm like so my life is so full mm. it's a challenge to do this and actually when i've got the window to record something i'm like i, I actually have to do this let's now. go yeah like i have to do it now because if i wait for a good time to do this then i might it might never come around. Could be the bad time. That could be a bad time to do a, a, a thing you think is good. Exactly. So I'm trying to. I'm trying to just like jump on it. And when when I had that first link up with Pitch and came away with all those beats, I came back to him within a day or two with like sketches of three different tracks, you know, and and blended together so that they kind of had a bit of a feeling of like they they could you know maybe be back to back on a record or something. Because I was like, I used to just take something away write an entire song mm. very like and, and keep going on that until and the producers probably like where is this guy yeah. like, you know this, in fact apologies to the producers <laughs> out there that this happened with yeah. who gave me great beats and I wrote something and it just never really ended up going anywhere because I was in that unrestricted creative zone and then other stuff in life gets in the way I was like I learned from that and mm. now I'm like no let me just quickly act on this and if even if it's a line on, on one of the ones that's turned out yeah. to be one of the best records on the album i only put down a little line or two on that beat but the feel of it and the sound of it was enough to be like it, it could be something in this yeah, space and I then it's it. something for him to react to and then it's also spurs me on you know mm. rather than it just being an idea in my head it actually now it physically exists mm -hmm. in some form and it can be shared and just keeping on that process led to this album being done in mm. some ways quite quickly. There's nothing more exciting mm. than to hear something of a development on, on a beat or a, or a song. Um, mm. Listen to that anecdote from Farrah Monch, like you must have been a pig in shit <laughs> <laughs> talking to Farrah Monch. Literally like, so tell me about when you... Like, tell me about how you... You know, uh, so all that... Craft, right? Yeah, that craft. guy's... And also there's something just very unique about him. Yeah. Uh, he, he... There's not really many... There's no one who's like oh, that. No. He's his own thing, his own style. I just get the feeling he, he's responsive to the environment, so it does not surprise me for a second that he he's, he's so um, dedicated to the craft. He's so um, top of his game. Mm. Ch just chuck him, in, chuck him in the Amazon and give him a fucking <laughs> mic and let's see what comes see out. what happens. Because it, it really is environmental for a lot of MCs, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very interesting, that. Like, but, I mean, he was an inspiration before... But to get the chance to meet him and hear about his craft yeah. Um, was, yeah, I learned. I oh, take notes. I he's take, a legend. take mental notes in these encounters. You know? Serious cat, serious mm. cat. Um, and it's those kind of people that are, act as like an okay sign. Mm. You know, if, you, if, if they're still doing it and they're doing it to like, no matter what's going on in all the other genres, cultures and decades, and, you know, mm. whether, whether you're born this year or 20 years ago, what holds true is is the strength in your ability and craft, isn't it? And, and something I've found that is proof of that is in the streaming era that we live in now and the ways that people access music, sometimes they're accessing music without the backstory. In fact, uh, often. Yeah. They, might, they have no idea who this tune is uh. or what the context it comes from is. And they've not been told about it in a magazine mm. or wherever else. Yeah. Like, they're just, it's just there. And yeah. they respond to it and they're like, this sounds good. Yeah. I like it. And there are people who whose records are like old tracks that have come, been around for ages 
that new people are getting into. Yeah. And you go to shows and you see there's young people and older people because people just access the music in this yeah. way. Yeah. Um, and that, that really shows you the stuff that stands the test of time. It shows you that true quality stands out and stays mm -hmm. and it remains a thing regardless of the comings and goings of like styles and sounds mm. and, and I guess fads or whatever you yeah. would call it, like whatever the buzz of the moment is. Some stuff just stays. Forever. It's like, you know, it's really good. That's a good point. I mean, you, you, my mind wandered to that point. You said, I thought Buster Rhymes mm -hmm. and like the generational shift in his audience that everyone knows, you know, rah, like a dungeon dragon mm -hmm. based off of maybe Nicki Minaj or something. Mm -hmm. There'll be kids mm -hmm. there. And people our age and older. Some of them will have their phones up the whole duration. Other people will be there barely moving because <laughs> they've break danced too much in their time. And <laughs> but what a dynamic, right? It's mad. I mean, I've I'm no Buster Rhymes, but I've experienced some level of that personally. Yeah, so yeah, cool, I did a I'm show sure. in uh, in Brixton a, a few months ago, and a guy came up to me in the crowd holding a copy of my first album, wow. CD copy. This is before wow. we repressed, so we, we repressed okay. it uh, on vinyl yeah. and we finally got it on digital again now. So it's it's now out there, the essence, my yeah. first album. Yeah. It's yeah, out yeah, there yeah. everywhere. But he, he um, came up to me, he was like, this album means a lot to me. I'm the same age as this album. <laughs> wow. Like, Excuse me? And, it, and he was like, my 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 dad raised me on this, you know. Like he's taught, you know, I learned, and I love these. That's records. incredible. And he goes, and he goes, and I I'm raising my kids listening to this. And I was like, what? Oh. And there I am thinking, there's three generations of a family yeah. where this this means something. I had it in other circumstances. A producer actually I've worked with, who um, he reached out to me because one of the albums I made is actually one in 2014. I did an album called The Misadventures of a Middleman, and he he used to listen to that record with um, his mother. <laughs> and then sadly, his, his mother passed away. Oh, wow. And he, he kind of connected to me online right. and told me a, a, of this. And we had like, I tried to be supportive of him and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And then he said, can I show you some beats and things? And he sent me some beats. The beats were phenomenal. Wow. We, I've recorded a bunch of stuff on that as well. That will come uh, sometime soon as well. But like, I'm starting to realize these connections across different generations. This guy was, was much younger than yeah. me, you know, and there's like different pitch, pitch 92. He's, <laughs> he's a different generation to me, you know, like he, one of the reasons why when I had that link up and he was playing me beats, it was like nine out of 10 I, I was picking was because he knows my stuff. Mm -hmm. He listened to my stuff. He, he kind of grew up listening to my yeah. stuff. And so he didn't just send me any old beats, whatever. Like, he was like, you might like this. And in fact, even more than that, maybe there's some level of influence where the stuff he likes making is like, it's just common ground. That's yeah. part of the reason why the album's called Resonance, because instantly there was this feeling of resonance and connection on a, on a creative level, you know, wow. where it's just like, you know, echoes between different generations of like the style and the sound of music, where it's like instinctive. Before, yeah, back and forth. It's a play, isn't it? It's a constant play. Hip hop is so, it's everywhere. Mm. It's, 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 it's always been the news. And if there is no connectivity between what's really going on on the ground, no matter what age and what's, what value does it actually have? Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's interesting. Like, I feel there's so many different styles and sounds and subgenres mm. within it, and it changes so fast. And there's this whole thing of it being, a, you know, a, a young, a youth culture. Mm. And so as soon as you're past a certain age, it's like, you know, you're no longer the thing. You know, Get, out like, Get out of here. But it's coming, it's come of age yeah, where that's... like actually, and actually maybe it is because of my maturity <laughs> that like I'm, I'm interested in the perspective. So Andre 3000, when he came out with his flute album, yeah. he was, I think, trolling a bit when he said this, but he was like, what am I going to do as a rapper in my 40s like to rap? Like I'm, I'd rather play the flute in a way because like, I don't know what to say. I could talk mm. about going for for a, a colonoscopy or something. Yes. <laughs> He's like, I don't think people want to hear that. There's a song by Fonte about health and about like, you know, physical issues and stuff like that in Family Members. Mm. That's an amazing record by someone in their 40s. There I'm assuming go. he's in his 40s. There you go, yeah. Where I'm like, that is, is a deeply insightful thing and it's relatable, you know. It's not gross, by the way. It's a nice, <laughs> good song. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I forget yeah. what it's called. it's called. I think it's called Expensive Genes. Expensive Genes, mm. G-E-N. It's, yeah, it's a masterpiece, check it out. That's funny, I think, you know, in the case and point of Andre 3000, maybe he's... Maybe he's just l slightly lost his 
direction or connection with the street that he feels maybe brought him in? I th- I I personally think he was just playing insane. Really, I think I just quote it's on some level. Yeah, yeah, I get where you. I think he does what he chooses to do, and let me be really clear about this: that man can do whatever he likes, <laughs> he can, do whatever he, he wants. He like, do, he can do whatever he wants. Contribu- we yeah, love him. The flute album, I'm here for it. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do yeah, what yeah. you like, bro. Like, yeah. he, he's definitely earned yeah. his seat at the table. You don't have to say nothing. You just do it. Just do, do, it. do it. So so, um, but I I do feel like that man has bars, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I think he still yeah. has bars. Yeah. Because if you really ha- have bars, then you, you probably still do. Yeah. So I think he'll, they'll, I cross my fingers, there'll be something in future mm. where he's like, oh, actually, maybe I will talk about stuff. Mm-hmm. So I've heard things by him that are just ridiculously good on, yeah. a, on a bars level. So I don't, I, I don't have a doubt about that. <laughs> There's loads of lyricists out there. And they should all be taking a leaf in your book. They're just keeping the level high, keeping the releases going, the bar up, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, I just love the fact that we got you in time, ready for for a, 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 an eventual release. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, we're in in full flight at the moment. Yeah. So, in fact, this know. Friday, right? Yeah, this yeah. Friday. I'm trying to figure out just when does this come out. Like, Don't worry, Kid <laughs> this... Podcast. Don't let people down, baby. Ah, you're fast on it. So yeah, this Friday, um, I've got a single coming out with Pitch Ninety Two. It's called nice. Heavyweights. Wicked. And there was a track called Heavyweight Singular, which came out at the last, uh, just the end of last year which was the first sort of warm up really to this phase that, that, that we're entering into with this album with me and Pitch. But this is now a single from the rollout for the album. There's wow. going to be a couple more singles in the coming months as well. And then drop it when they want it. And then the album will come out, you know, and, and this, this track is like a, the original heavyweight was like a, the concept was a one man posse cut. So there's me on there doing like different cadences and different voices, almost like different characters, you know? That's and then hard. I was like, but now I need to do, the actual posse cut version. So I reached out to a, a group of top tier lyricists to get them involved in it as well. And also like, I'm going to be real, like I have a load of people I've been meaning to do things creatively with. And again, it's that mentality of, Oh, wait for the, when's the right time for this? That? Mm. And then one of those people was Ty. Mm. And I'd always been like, yeah, me and Ty, we'll make a record together. We, we were, he was super supportive of me in my career, like mm-hmm. he was for the whole community. Mm-hmm. And I looked up to him and there was common ground musically. And, you know, we connected all the time. He'd always shout me out and show love. And I was like, yeah, one day we'll make a record, I'm yeah. sure. In fact, I swear, it, vague memories of talking to him and Soweto Kinch, I think, about doing something together once years ago. And then he was gone. Like, you know, may he rest in peace. You yeah, know, rest and, in peace, and love to his family Absolutely. and his loved ones and sorry for your yeah, loss. Man. And and it, it kind of um it was a wake up call for me to and it, it I like to say it's the he taught me a lot of lessons, you know, from the example he showed for us all. Um and that was the final one, which is wow. like don't wait for the perfect time. Just like just get on it. Just yeah. do things, you know. He you know, I learned that from that scenario. So with this track, I was like, let me just call up all the people. And again, to that point we talked about earlier, when people are like, can I help? Or like, when I was like, do you want to do this? The people are like, yeah, bro, let's go. Like, let's let's uh, go. So I've got yeah. this ridiculous monster lineup of like, really? top tier lyricists. Yeah. Well, I won't ask because it would be any point. You know, to get, it, get it to know yourself and Check go, oh, yeah, Check man. I'm confident that there's not, not been a lineup like this in a long time really yeah, yeah, yeah. Confident. Confident. That. um that's a mm. beautiful sentiment to sign off on and one i'd like to also add is um rest in peace to my brother coasty yeah. um from 360 physicals who passed away he's a lifelong um friend within the scene and he will be missed within the uk hip-hop field right 100 percent. sorry for your loss brother yeah, yeah man may he rest in peace he rest in good peace coasty yeah he was yeah. very much so 360 physicals forever um and poisonous poets and more everyone mm. that was uh in and still is a part of our uh mm. our journey and our landscape essay you legend thank you so yes, much for bro. passing through thanks for having me bro it's been fun yeah oh, we are like him was out of fashion serves you right you know what I mean? Hold tight, everybody, all the shares and carers, people that have been jumping, supporting from the jump. Um, and moreover, crime don't pay, neither do they. You look after yourself. Don't talk to anyone, I wouldn't. Peace! <laughs> How do you do that, bro?